2021. I'm your chair, Gordon McNeely. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, members of the gallery here today, our guests, and um, with us in the committee, we have uh, committee members uh, Michelle Beaton, Carla Bernard, uh, Mark McLean uh, is in today, Zach Bell, and visiting with us is uh, Lynn Lund. So the first thing I want to do is, can I get adopt an adoption of the agenda? Uh, Michelle Beaton. Um, today we're going to receive uh, a briefing on uh, the drink spiking incidents in, in Charlottetown. So I'd like to, to uh, say hello to all our guests today. Um, and uh, just, just to let the guests know uh, and the, the people watching at home, we'll be a little bit slower with transition. Everybody's going to be welcome to speak. Um, but we'll be a little bit slower with transition because of uh, some technical issues uh, that happened recently in here. So I will identify you and, and then, then you will uh, be able to, to speak at, at will. So what I will do is I'll pass it over for, to um, whoever's going to start with uh, Rachel maybe. like Okay, and then you could maybe introduce everybody or I could do it or just so that everybody's name's on the record. And then uh, you can proceed with your presentation and we will save questions from the members to the end of the presentation. Okay, floor is yours. Sure. So uh, I'm Dr. Rachel Crowder. I am the executive director of the PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Center, and I'm very happy to be here to speak uh, to you today about drug-facilitated sexual assault. I'm also grateful to the activists, advocates, and colleagues from community-based organizations who created an ad hoc committee to support the survivors coming forward with their stories. They've been a key resource and support for me as I prepared this presentation. And some are here today. Uh, Jane Ledwell from the uh, Advisory Council on the Status of Women, uh, Kinley Dowling, who is a survivor and an advocate, and uh, the, the team from uh, Community Legal Information are here today. Sarah Dennis was also a member of our ad hoc committee, but also uh, supporting uh, the presentation today are Ellen Mullally, who is the executive director of Community Legal Information. Kathy Jenkins, who's sitting behind her, is a legal navig navigator for the RISE program. And uh, my colleague uh, and therapist at, uh, a hardworking therapist at uh, PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Center, uh, Alyssa Coughlin. So that's everyone. Uh, I also want to mention those that were on this committee that were not able to be here today, Jillian Kilfoyle at Women's Network PEI, Michelle Jay, uh, uh, Advisory Council, and Eileen Conboy in her role as chair of our organization, PEERSAC, and also the Sexual Violence Prevention and Response um, Office at UPEI. So, let's see, how do I operate this thing? Did that work? No, it turned it off. <laughs> hmm. Okay, we'll try the enter button. Yes, all right. <laughs> Okay, so this is a very dense slide, so uh, it's, uh, it's just to say that we're here not only to lament the problem, but to suggest some solutions, so ways forward that we can begin to explore, discuss, and implement towards an unraveling and a rebuilding. I will begin with a snapshot of the problem, then some ideas that have been or are in process of being implemented and or used in other places, and maybe some new ideas. This is not comprehensive, but it's a start. I would ask you to make a list of questions as I go through uh, the presentation, and I'll be very happy to answer those questions at the end. There's going to be a lot of information in a very short time, so I have uh, this presentation with notes and resources for your further study and reference, so you would have gotten a, a USB uh, drive. Due to recent activism by survivors of drug-facilitated sexual assault, and I'll be referring to it as DFSA, and the ensuing media coverage, DFSA is very much in focus these days, but it is not a new issue, but one that has actually been around for millennia, yes, thousands of years, um, as it, in, it includes alcohol-facilitated uh, facilitated sexual assault. It is not a standalone issue, but the tip of the iceberg that is surfacing at the moment. It is a category of sexualized violence, which has to be understood within the context of all types of gender-based violence, which means at its heart, it's about human rights and it's about equality. Women and Gender um, Equality Canada defines 
gender-based violence, or GBV, as violence based on gender norms and unequal power dynamics perpetrated against someone based on their gender, gender expression, gender identity, or perceived gender. It takes many forms, including physical, economic, sexual, as well as emotional, psychological abuse. GBV floats in an ocean of, what shall I call it, uh, patriarchy, misogyny, rape culture, or perhaps to use more academic language, there is a larger context and interlocking oppressions that makes this a layered, complex, toxic system that requires layered and complex responses. I've been chipping away at this system professionally for almost four decades, living it for almost seven decades, but I feel hopeful at the moment that we are riding a momentum of change. I also have days when I feel quite the other way. Earlier this week, as a matter of fact, we uh, commemorated the uh, December 6th um, Montreal massacre, and that was a hard day. But these past few weeks, I have been inspired and in awe of the courage of the survivors who have come forward to tell their stories and the support that they have received from other survivors advocates, allies, news media, and others. And those of us who have power, privilege, and a mandate to serve the public should seize the opportunity to harness this momentum. Some key statistics on gender-based violence in Canada. While anyone in Canada can experience violence, women, girls, and young women, Indigenous women and girls, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, women living with a disability, and women living in rural and remote regions are at greater risk of violence. Women account for almost eight in 10 victims of intimate partner violence. Women also account for the vast majority of victims, 77% of intimate partner homicides, also known as femicide. Between 2009 and 2014, the vast majority, 87% of police reported sexual assault victims were women or girls, most of whom, 70%, were under the age of 25. The rate of self-reported violent victimization was nearly twice as high among women than among men in 2019. This difference was driven by sexual assault, the rate of which is more than five times higher among women than men, with 15 to 24-year-old females the most vulnerable age group. In general, research shows that racialized women are less uh, taken less seriously when reporting sexual violence. 60% of Indigenous uh, girls and women experience sexual violence by the age of 15. Women with disabilities are three times more likely to be sexually assaulted, and 49% of sexual minority folks are twice as likely to be sexually assaulted, double the rate of cisgendered heterosexual women. This is a very brief snapshot of stats to remind us that an intersectional lens has to be kept in mind and brought to any analysis of the incidents and impacts of all kinds of sexual violence, including DFSA. As I said earlier, there is a larger context and interlocking oppressions that makes this a layered, complex, toxic system that requires layered and complex responses. This is the culture that conditions us, conditions our responses to sexual violence and victim survivors of sexual violence. It's about power and control, about protecting and keeping folks who are in the highest positions of power and economic control because of a privileged birth into a dominant race, into a male gender, able-bodied, with educational and economic opportunities, and so on. Sexual violence is an effective tool because it is so traumatizing, so isolating. It breaks down our relationship with ourselves and with each other, all our relationships. The resulting isolation is so devastating because we are wired to connect. Rape is a common tool of war. There is a war on women, girls, especially the women and girls mentioned in the previous slide on gender non-conforming folks, on black, indigenous, and people of color, people with disabilities, anyone perceived as weak or other. Rape culture is when approximately 460,000 sexual assaults occur in Canada each year and less than 10% are reported to police. 
when survivors are blamed, treated with suspicion, or accused of lying, when people make jokes about sexual violence, when sexual and gender-based harassment are experienced by many people on a daily basis, when women are taught how to not get raped, or women watch your drinks, instead of focusing on the real issue, the prevailing norms and attitudes that justify, tolerate, normalize, and minimize sexual violence. One in three women will experience sexual assault in their lifetime. One in three. How many women do you have in your family? Colleagues, friends. How many women are in this room? We can assume, assume that about a third of us are sexual assault survivors in this room. This is the context in which DFSA, DFSA manifests. As you can see in the pyramid, tolerance of behaviors at the lowest section of the pyramid, jokes, locker room banter, supports or excuses those higher up, including drugging and rape. To change outcomes, we must change culture. It starts with challenging attitudes and changing behaviors. In recent days, I have attended community meetings that have included police who have stated that they have had few reports of DFSA each year. And I will say more about why women don't report and the criminal justice system in a moment, but let's continue to build contacts and talk about DFSA incidents from other sources to get a more holistic picture. The purpose of the Dumont study presented here, which happened during the period of 2005 to 2007 at Women's Hospital in Toronto, was to determine which persons uh, reporting sexual assault to a hospital-based treatment centre may have been covertly drugged and to provide information about whether a sexual assault may have occurred. A total of 184 of 882 eligible participants met suspected DFSA criteria. Mean age was 25.8 years, 96% were female, and almost 65% of those were white. Urine samples were positive for drugs in about 45% of cases, alcohol in 13%, and both drugs and alcohol in 18%. The drugs found on toxico toxicological screening were unexpected in 87 of the 135, or in about 64% of cases, with a positive drug finding and included <coughs> cannabinoids, cocaine, amphetamines, MDMA, which is also uh, sometimes referred to as ecstasy, ketamine, and GHB. Male DNA was unexpected in about 47% of cases where it was found. Among those persons presenting to a sexual assault treatment center with a suspicion of DFSA, the presence of unexpected drugs and male DNA was common, lending support for their connotation that they had been intentionally drugged and sexually assaulted. Notable in this study is that most unexpected drugs found were not those typically described as date rape drugs. So rohypnol, for example, was not present. PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Center offers individual and group counseling to adult, uh, that's age 16 plus, survivors of sexual violence of all genders. We currently have a wait list of 10 to 12 months, but prioritize individuals who have been assaulted recently. We try to get them in to see a counselor within 72 hours. We do not operate a crisis line or have staff or volunteers to provide accompaniment to hospital, police, and court. Here is what two of four of our therapists are seeing in their caseloads at the present moment. All statistics need to have plenty of context in order to understand them, and in this case, we need to keep in mind that we do not always see all the individuals who have presented at hospitals, nor do the hospital ESAS programs see all the clients we serve. Our staff reports that of the above individuals on the slide who have uh, experienced uh, 
drug-facilitated sexual assault. One of these clients was drugged at a local bar and assaulted recently. She explained that this is not the first time she was suspected of being drugged. Um, there has been other experiences of assaults related to drugging. Some clients have been, uh, sorry, some of these incidents have been reported to police in past, no charges pressed. Client did not uh, report the most recent assault, fearful of outcome, and has had bad experiences in the past with reporting both to police and hospital. Four other clients with suspected druggings, uh, one person was a recent assault from the last few months, uh, ended up in a stranger's bed, physical marks on body next morning after leaving a bar alone and not feeling well. No substance confirmed after hospital testing, did report but does not want to press charges at this point. DFSA occurs when alcohol or other drugs are used to sedate or incapacitate a person in order to perpetuate or perpetrate, sorry, sexual assault. Important to remember that alcohol has been the drug of choice for DFSA since, who knows, since the beginning of human history when alcohol was invented. There are also generally two categories of DFSA, proactive and opportunistic. Unfortunately, in my view, our criminal justice system seems to be stuck on the idea of judging whether there is enough evidence available to prove the proactive kind of DFSA when drugs are suspected, and little interest in investigating what they perceive as the opportunistic kind of DFSA, exemplified by the usual response to media by police, women, watch your drinks. Whichever one we are talking about, it still boils down to the principle and Canadian law on consent, which I will get to in a few slides. But first, let's look at what else has been happening in the PEI context. Just for the record, and not because we necessarily need to be reminded, here is some of the recent media coverage of police investigations of recent DFSA incidents that sparked responses from community advocates and activists regarding this issue, including the inadequate responses to historical cases of DFSA that victim survivors have experienced from the criminal justice system. I will give you a moment to refresh your um, memories about these uh, stories and events, and also say that if you have not read these stories, I've included them in your information package, so they're on the slide, or the, uh, the USB, um, uh, um, the thumb drive that I gave you. I may not have captured the whole chain of events, but it, it appears that the most current tip of the iceberg experience began with the reporting of drink spiking by Charlottetown Police early November, which initiated a number of follow-up media stories um, with community organization-based uh, advocates, and then the courageous survivor-based activism by Kinley Dowling, reported by Kate McKenna and Shauna Perry's heart-wrenching story reported by Allison Jenkins. As I mentioned earlier, in recent days, I have attended community meetings where police have stated that they have had very few reports of DFSA over this and past years, and that these cases are extremely hard to prove because of the fugitive nature of the drugs in a person's system. However, as in Shauna Perry's case, as reported in The Guardian of November 28th, it appears that even when a rape kit is done and the drugs are proven to be present and there is DNA evidence of the male acquaintance and there is blood and bruising on the victim's body, it is determined or was determined probably by the Crown Prosecutor, that there was not enough evidence to provide a reasonable prospect of conviction. I was stunned when I read the article, and I felt more than just a little sick as well. So let's look at some of the responses to DFSA. Some critics of police services have rightly analyzed some of the problematic interactions with victims who report as not being trauma-informed and the implicit bias or conditioning that we carry from growing up and living in a rape culture. 
as you may or may not know, in some jurisdictions like PEI, the police must seek Crown approval before charging individuals under the criminal code, and the Crown will only determine that a charge may be laid if it can pass two tests. The first is that there is a reasonable prospect of conviction, and the second is that it is in the public interest to do so. So I think the problem here is not just police practices and attitudes, but the whole criminal justice system, including the Crown. I am sure that the Crown's reluctance to prosecute these cases creates in the minds of investigating officers a deterrent, or um, a handy excuse, for not pursuing these cases, knowing that their efforts will likely go nowhere. I don't know how much more evidence is required than was gathered in the case of Shauna Perry. And I certainly think that this case is in the public interest. It's in the public interest. It's in the interest of humanity. It's in the interest of protecting women and girls. To quote Dr. Holly Johnson, a criminologist and criminology professor at the University of Ottawa, among cases police consider to be legit legitimate cases, less than half result in charges against a suspect. Dismissal of sexual assault cases then continues throughout the justice system. Half of suspects face a prosecution, and just half of prosecutions result in a conviction. In other words, just one in 10 sexual assaults recorded by police as legitimate lead to a conviction. If we factor in the 95% of sexual assaults that are not reported to police, as well as those classified as unfounded, a perpetrator is held accountable in less than 1% of all sexual assaults. This spells impunity for sexual predators. This spells impunity for sexual predators. Shauna Perry's assailant left her bruised and bleeding, suggesting she had resisted, and he ignored it. Shauna's blood panel showed the evidence of rohypnol, suggesting she may very well have been unconscious or slipping in and out of consciousness. Shauna did not take the rohypnol voluntarily, suggesting intent to do harm. When it comes to the reasonable prospect of conviction, the laws pertaining to consent to sexual activity are not as sympathetic to victims of DFSA as we might like to think they are, or as clear as they should be to make the prospect of conviction, especially in DFSA cases, more likely. In her article for the Toronto Star, Alicia Hashem reported on a Halifax cab driver charged with sexually assaulting an intoxicated woman in his cab and, incidentally, also beat a conviction for sexually assaulting a drunk woman he picked up and took back to his apartment. Legal Education and Action Fund, LEAF, and Avalon Sexual Assault Centre in Halifax have been working hard on this file with some short-term victories but ultimately culminating in a loss. The Halifax cab driver has beaten the charges on both cases on appeal. Alicia Hashem wrote, what is clear is that being sexually assaulted while incapacitated is a real and widespread issue. A Statistics Canada survey from 2014 found that 633,000 people self-reported being sexually assaulted that year, mostly women. Of those, 9% reported that they had been sexually assaulted when they were incapable of consenting because they were drugged or intoxicated. This is a serious problem, says Lise Gotel, a law professor at the University of Alberta. It is important then that the courts clearly articulate the threshold of incapacity with regard to intoxication. The problem is we don't have a clearly articulated threshold. The courts have not done that yet. In other words, there is no clear legal line beyond which someone becomes too intoxicated to consent. The criminal code states only that a person cannot consent to sex when they are incapable. Although I am not speaking to the Standing Committee on Justice and Public Safety, I, it cannot be ignored that legal reform and supporting organizations like LEAF and sexual assault centers to push for fairer criminal justice system 
uh, must continue. And we should learn from the Nova Scotia experience to do our share fair of legal reform in Prince Edward Island. Also important um, is working directly with police in reviewing sexual assault files. Uh, using advocate-based case reviews, uh, we look at the files uh, of reported sexual assault that have been cleared without charge being laid. Advocate-based review committees play a valuable role in giving feedback to police services about investigation practices, including how victims are questioned, how evidence is gathered or not, looking for uh, how attitudes, language, and behavior that are or are not from a trauma-informed approach and demonstrate an understanding of the laws about consent. So currently, uh, PEERSAC and other community-based um, representatives are sitting on the RCMP Sexual Assault Investigation Review Committees, which is now uh, in its second year. Uh, more recently, I have been speaking to Charlottetown Police Service and uh, we are about to engage in a discussion on the collaborative framework for advocacy-based case reviews with uh, Sunny Mariner, who is the national uh, expert on case review processes. Uh, but we have two more urban police services uh, that have not been in touch, and uh, we need to engage with them as well. Uh, PEI has uh, one of the worst uh, records for um, unfounded cases in the country. We should also be looking at other different responses, responses to sexual violence, and I'm going to uh, touch on each one of these uh, briefly. Even though these, these uh, uh, slides are very, very dense, um, I can't go through them, but please uh, um, uh, study them. So the criminal justice system, by its very um, nature or genesis in property law, um, is not the best place for survivors to turn to for justice. This system considers the sexual, sexual assault as a crime against the Crown, so victim survivors have no control in this process. They are considered uh, a witness to the crime, uh, and only just recently have uh, sexual assault survivors gained permission to engage legal counsel when they've been um, asked to present. Um, to be present as, uh, as witnesses. We are in the early days of restorative justice here on Prince Edward Island, um, and it, some caveats have been expressed around uh, TJ. It's not a silver bullet. It works for some, not for others, uh, but it's part of the solution to, as I said before, this very, very complex problem. Another uh, area that I think is worthy of considering are specialized courts. Uh, very recently, a Quebec uh, bill aimed at creating a court that specializes in crimes involving victims of domestic and sexual violence has been unanimously passed. Bill 92 is the first ever of its kind in the world. The goal of the new law is to better support victims during all stages of the judicial process and to remove barriers that stop them from coming forward with allegations. The creation of this tribunal was one of the recommendations made last December by a committee of more than 20 experts who presented a report titled Rebuilding Trust to the Quebec Government. The committee made 190 recommendations aimed at ensuring victims of sexual assault and domestic violence feel supported from the moment they come forward. It says uh, that services available should be integrated so victims don't have to relive the trauma by repeatedly recounting the assault. So I recommend that PEI keep an eye on this pilot and learn from their experiences. In the Globe and Mail article that was uh, done by Robin Doolittle um, a few years ago, uh, in her analysis, uh, she found a correlation between having an above average number or percentage of female officers, police officers, and a lower than average unfounded uh, numbers of sexual violence um, uh, cases in those police services. The unfounded rate among communities with a higher than average percentage of female officers was 15%. 
I don't know what the percentage of, it, of female officers is in our police services on Prince Edward Island, but police and the police academy should consider stepping up hiring practices and changing workplace culture to attract and retain female officers and academy instructors. Just need to take a breath yes, and a drink. Take your time. <laughs> doing, doing great. Almost there. There has been much work done to implement the enhanced emergency sexual assault service model at Island Hospitals. It has taken literally years to come to fruition, and lately the addition of a third option or anonymous sexual assault uh, investigation or evidence kits um, have taken the pressure off survivors around reporting their assault to police. Third option allows survivors up to a year to give police ac uh, access, sorry, the third option allows survivors up to a year to decide whether or not to give police access to evidence collected and to begin the process of giving their statement. Thumbs up. And thumbs up also to uh, ESAS nurses at the hospital. There are, however, still some concerns um, about attitudes and behaviors of staff that survivors come into contact with in emergency departments who, for example, make re-traumatizing comments or treat survivors uh, disrespectfully or worse, brutally. The whole of the staff at hospitals need to receive trauma-informed training on an ongoing basis, preferably in person, as opposed to a slide deck on a computer on a computer. It requires time, sensitivity, and learning in relationship to build compassion and understanding. We have also heard anecdotally that someone inside the QEH who is knowledgeable says that the lab does not always produce accurate results when it comes to DFSA testing. We believe this source is credible. Our services at Prince Edward Island Rape and Sexual Assault Centre are stretched to the limit. I'm also aware that community mental health, as you probably are aware as well, have wait lists and most of our referrals come from them. As I mentioned before, we triage uh, recent within one month survivors to be seen within 72 hours, all others. Uh, it is a 10 month wait in Charlottetown and a 12 month wait in Summerside and Alberton. To eliminate the wait list, we need four more therapists and more office space. To cope, that would clear our wait list. To cope, we need at least two more therapists. We are currently piloting a sexual violence prevention and public education co coordinator. Um, this position and positions like it are absolutely essential to do the community-based education that is needed to change culture at a very young age and throughout all age um, span, well, the lifespan. Um, but this is, we have funding for a pilot for a year. This really needs to be a permanent and permanently funded position. There's also been a need expressed for 24-7 service response for victim accompaniment, hospital, police, and court. And this is not an uncommon service for other rape crisis and sexual assault centers to be offering, <coughs> excuse me, across the country. At the current moment, we cannot offer those services. We're already stretched to the limit. Other supports needed for sexual violence survivors. Just as this problem is complex, victims' needs um, and supports are also layered and complex. <coughs> Housing, basic income, legal needs, children and child care. The trauma is complex, but so are the impacts on survivors' ability to work to support themselves and their families. So please consider the advocacy done by others for minimum income provisions. Resources to other organizations like Community Legal in Information and their RISE program, which is a short-term program to navigate the legal system. It needs to be made uh, permanent and annual. In the meantime, we are providing survivors. We, uh, I know at PeerSAC we're doing this. I'm sure other organizations are providing survivors with subsidies for food, 
transportation, childcare, and feminine hygiene project products, just the basic needs. Victims have layered needs. I think one of the most important things also is to believe survivors, survivors of DFSA and all forms of gender-based violence. I've also been advocating and will continue to advocate that we consider renaming the Premier's Action Committee on Family Violence Prevention to the Premier's Action Committee on Gender-Based Violence. It more accurately uh, captures and reflects what this committee uh, should be about. And research is absolutely critical to um, really getting a, an understanding of what the incidence rates is of sexual violence through the lifespan um, on Prince Edward Island. Uh, we are currently, um, we currently have a research application in with uh, Public Health um, Agency of Canada to do this kind of research, um, but we have come short of being able to do a complete study. We only have enough money if we get the funding from FAC for a pilot um, program or pilot research. And thumbs up to the Adult Sexual Violence Response Task Group that has been formed this year. Um, I will be presenting to them uh, next week as well. And um, I think that this uh, sends a hopeful and positive message to all of us on Prince Edward Island that uh, sexual violence is being taken uh, seriously. So just in summary, here is a list of actions to start with. And number one is believe survivors like any other major crime, <clears throat> false reporting is around 1 to 2 percent. It's very, very low. I've talked about police and justice reform. This isn't, I'm not ranking these, these are just sort of the, but number one is ranked. The other three are not necessarily ranked. Justice and police form, prevention, and resourcing the community. So I want to thank you for uh, listening to my presentation, and um, I would like to uh, invite um, Kinley Dowling to say a few words, followed by uh, Jane Lovey, if there's time. Just, just uh, um, I will uh, just signal the people in the booth there that uh, the microphone is uh, belongs to Kinley Dowling right now. Thank you. Just wait till. Sure. It that was amazing Rachel thank you um, hi uh, my name is Kinley Dowling I'm a musician and a songwriter and I'm an advocate for survivors of sexual assault as well in 2019 I received a message from a friend who confided in me that back in 2010 she had been drugged she never had any, any answers from that night and it has been bothering her since 2010 not knowing who she could trust and not knowing exactly what happened that night really scared her. Her story really shook me and I wanted to help her find out exactly what happened. Since this is such a small city, I figured we could probably find out what happened that night. I always keep my friend anonymous and when I started asking around about Rohypnol being used in Charlottetown, I could not believe how many people came forward telling me that they had been drugged in that same year of 2010. In June of this year, I posted on social media how crazy it was to me how many women in Charlottetown had been drugged in 2010, and that if we got together, we could probably figure out where the roofies came from. In one week, I received 17 stories total. They ranged from 2006 to 2016, and 13 of those stories happened between 2010 and 2011. Some of the assaults happened by people the survivor was friends with, was an acquaintance, was an intimate partner, or they were complete strangers. Lots still have no idea who drugged them and still don't know who assaulted them. They have so many unanswered questions. Kate McKenna, an investigative journalist from CBC, wrote an incredible article bringing light to the situation, which is the reason why we're here talking today. After that article came out, I received an, ad an additional 14 stories. There are 12 people involved because sadly two of the women have been drugged twice in their life. Many of these people have never reported their druggings to the police for a multitude of reasons. And when you look at the fact that no investigation by Charlottetown police has led to the charge of administering a noxious substance in the last 20 years, it would feel pretty hopeless that any justice would be served. Since 2001, there have been 16 complaints to police, but no charges were ever laid. 
The main theme that I've noticed in the stories that have been brought to the police is that the police are not supporting or encouraging the survivors. They tell the survivors there's no point in pressing charges and that evidence is almost impossible to inquire, acquire, even if oftentimes the survivor is providing all the details and evidence themselves. In one instance, there was even a confession from the person who drugged and assaulted her, but no charges were laid. Like I mentioned before, two of the women were drugged and assaulted on two separate occasions. The first time it happened to one of the women, the police officer said to the woman's father, she does this a lot, doesn't she? Implying that the woman was at fault in her own assault. Later, the officer told the woman, you're going to be torn apart on the stand because you were drinking. And it's a he said, she said story. I'm glad that Rachel Crowder is here on PEI doing this amazing work that is so greatly needed. There are so many folks whose job it is to help survivors, like all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> but something that would help uh, a great deal is stopping the drug drugs from getting on the street and punishing people when they are drugging other human beings. It seems pretty simple. Also, like Rachel said before, stop telling women to watch their drinks and start telling men to stop spiking drinks. Some of the stories I received went back to 2004, some are as recent as a month ago. So that's 17 years of people getting away with administering a noxious substance, often followed by committing a sexual assault. That's a lifetime of trauma for the survivor. There are so many supports needed for someone who survives something like this. There are great supports in PEI for survivors of druggings and anyone who has been abused. The RISE program, the PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Sexual Assault Center, which has a year waiting list. Uh, there's also victim services. We need to make sure that places like RISE and the PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Center are well-funded and well-staffed, since the ones working there have no rest. They're working diligently, but they're completely bombarded with cases. And I just want to reiterate that there is a year waiting list to talk to a counselor at the PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Center. Everywhere I go, women stop to tell me about how they know someone who has been drugged. Everyone I've talked to knows someone who has been drugged in PEI. I found out lots of my close friends were drugged, but they didn't bring it up before now because they were too embarrassed or traumatized and tried to bury it deep down inside themselves. So they never had to feel those feelings again. But as trauma goes, it doesn't really work that way. It always finds a way to rear its ugly head. The first step in addressing that trauma is to believe survivors. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you, Kinley. Um, so now we'll turn Jane Ledwell's mic on. Um, I have uh, something that is a handout, um, and I apologize that it wasn't done before now. Um, so it's it's also not taped together. Um, this is the Legislative Assembly. I bet you didn't know that you would be coming with some assembly required. Um, and th th this is a work in progress, so I, I, uh, it is labeled a draft. Um, and I have some additional copies that I've just collated. Um, I know that people watching at home will not be able to see this resource. Uh, it is something that we will be making public as we go along. Um, but for, just before, I just want to take a moment to say this is very tough stuff. Um, there are a lot, there, there's, I, I'm feeling a lot from Kinley's comments and from Rachel's comments. And just to, just to take that moment to say, we know there are survivors in this room. We know there are people who love survivors in this room. And if you need to just check out and listen later, there's, take care of yourselves. Take care of yourselves in that. Um, it's a formal proceeding, but we're human beings in this formal proceeding. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so the resource that, um, that I have put together with the help of the fine people who are, are here um, is, is designed as a tool, it's a flow chart um, uh, that is designed as a tool for looking at where there is the potential for interventions um, that can make a difference for survivors getting the desired outcomes that they have, for the community getting the desired outcome that we have, which is the restoration of survivors into our community, the restoration of perpetrators 
in our community for the interest of health and safety. Um, so there are a couple of things that, um, that I hope that the flowchart indicates. The first is the range of outcomes that victims desire is very frequently not focused exclusively on criminal justice. It can be anything from wanting an apology, just wanting things settled, wanting not to have to see someone day to day in a workplace or in school or, um, or on the news. Um, so that's, that's the first thing at, at the top that I wanted to illustrate. In looking at what some of the next steps are for a victim who has had an experience and wants to move towards healing, move towards any of those desired outcomes, the next section, there's a range of actions. And you know the support services that Kinley mentioned, um, the steps that someone has to take to ensure that they are emotionally safe to act, they are physically safe from the perpetrator, that they know what the options available are, and they have the supports they need to take those next steps. Um, what I think this section illustrates is that there are a lot of resources, but it is a huge amount of work. The continued burden on the victim really stands out when we look at it as a flowchart. When the victim decides to move forward with an experience and a story towards private healing, towards going to the media, asking for medical help, and, ask, or, and considering a police report, it, it's another layer of work for the victim. And so the, the, this victim section is a lot of work. It goes often in a circle. And there are very few paths to the desired outcomes and consequences. Um, there's also, because of victim blaming, there, there's a lot of challenge in, in, in the, within reporting to media, medical help, police uh, or justice officials. Um, with the services above, there's, there's, a, there's a, an expectation and a, it's built in that survivors are believed or that it begins by believing. In the next section, we're really opening ourselves up to that culture of, uh, of, of non-belief of survivors. So what's alarming on the, the, the next steps when we look at the perpetrator and we look at the potential paths to desired outcomes for survivors, the potential paths to criminal justice proceedings, to restorative justice proceedings, to, to any kind of mediated settlement, a private mediated settlement, what really stands out in, in analyzing the flow of operations is that in so many ways, the denial of harm, the perpetrator's denial of harm, creates a full stop. So the only way to get to restorative or private solutions is through an admission of guilt, an admission that there's been harm. The only way past a denial that says, you know, it was he said, she said, that says, yes, something happened, but it was consensual, that says I didn't do anything, or just says innocent until proven guilty, any form of those denials, there are very few good ways past that, but they, they go through, currently, police investigation. And that's why um, the CBC story on the lack of police investigation is so alarming, because there are, there are no pathways without that police investigation to any desired outcome. None, none, none. So it's quite alarming. And um, so after that police investigation, there's a process for police collection of evidence, of crown assessment <coughs> of evidence, with considerations um, like the ones that Rachel spoke about. And we've, she also spoke about how few of those um, resolutions are getting, getting where we want. 
And just a reminder that where we want to get is not only those desired outcomes for survivors, but where we want to get is that community restoration. Restoration of survivors within our community, restoration of health and, and wellness and well-being, and, and, and for perpetrators who are ready to change as well. So um, this is a work in progress. We will be sharing it with you again. We will share it publicly. The hope is that it can illustrate the barriers and opportunities for making changes that make things better. So that's, um, that's me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. It's a very important document. And um, so just checking with our, with our other guests if there's anything that they, if, if anybody wants to add anything. Um, Sarah? I'm just talking to you a little bit. Do you have an extender for this thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's pretty sensitive. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say thank you to Kinley, uh, Jane, and Rachel for sharing. Um, I just want to echo that uh, Rise certainly, um, you know, hears stories um, every day uh, similar to what these folks have shared. And um, we do hear, you know, um, dissatisfaction or trauma related to um, coming forward uh, within the criminal justice system, especially, um, and feeling like, okay, what now? Um, that didn't work for me. Um, I experienced some level of harm in that in that um, retelling of my story. Um, so where do I go from here? And then certainly. Um, they may consider um, civil recourse as well, but can they afford that? You know, uh, likely not. Um, so I just want to echo that, you know, we are hearing that from survivors all the time, and that um, certainly there is a need for increased capac capacity within the community to support survivors. And, um, you know, the first uh, stage of kind of like, um, building trust in the community for survivors is that they are believed and um, they often share that they feel that they are not. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alyssa was going to be the next to speak. Alyssa. Hi. Hey, everybody. My name is Alyssa and I'm the counselor at the PI Rape and Sexual Assault Center. just want to say I'm really thankful to be here. Um, it's the first time I've been at a committee like this, and I'm so thankful to be a part of seeing you all here because I work individually with, with clients. And so it's a really different experience of being in front of a group of people who are caring and working and seeing it all happen outside of my office, too. Um, and so it's a privilege to, to work with them individually and with you all, and so I just wanted to share a little bit, again, maybe about my work with clients without sharing any of their information, but what it looks like and sometimes how our hard it is to show up at our office. <laughs> and that our office is, you know, it's, it's, there it is, like we are supporting survivors, it's our message already and how much courage it takes to show up to our door and to sit in front of me who they don't know and to say, here's my story. Mm -hmm. And so I think that really speaks to, wow, the depth of our culture, to say that even at an organization where we are blatantly like, here's our mandate, it is so challenging because there is so much shame around talking about this. There is so much shame around it. And they've held that from the first time they've experienced sexual violence or assault. It's been heard through the periphery our whole lives growing up. And then to show up to our door and say, I am terrified to be here. I don't know who you are, basically. I don't know what's going on. And so that takes courage. And um, having worked you know, at the center for about a year and a half, there's so much connection between the stories I hear and survivors saying, you know, it just it feels like I can't tell anybody, nobody in their family, even closest friends, they're not talking about this. Or it takes years to come out and finally talk about it. And from the experiences I've heard of clients who have talked to the police right away or a first response and having it been, even if it's a family member where response is not held, where their story isn't held with you know, protection or honor about something that's hurt their spiritual self, their soul, their body, everything, it's, it's so destructive to have this happen to you. So to have it not be held is just, it's so painful. And I think the message it gives to, to survivors is, you know, 
I'm not sure if my emotional, physical, spiritual self is worthy of being protected. And what a message to give to people. Mm. You know, that's to have that and then that be held as I'm not even sure. I'm questioning if my self, my whole self is worthy of even being listened to or protected. What a scary thing. So, um, just to say that that's the depth of the work that I think happens within individuals themselves going through years and years and years of this work. Like you've all spoken, Kinley, you spoke as well. It's a, it's, it's a lifetime of healing from something that's traumatic like this. And it's going to be throughout, I know, my lifetime and way beyond that of healing a culture that is still perpetuating this. Um, so just speaking to how important this work is, how much courage it takes for people to show up and work through this system, and how hard my clients, the people I work with, how hard they're all working. Like the contrast sometimes, what it feels like, I think, for them between I am working so hard every single day, my clients, to just get through sometimes, to just take care of their children, to find some safety where their perpetrator lives down the street, or they keep running into them and are re-triggered and having intense physical, mental responses to being unsafe, like physically unsafe, is a lot. <laughs> so they are working so hard and I think it feels like it's just painful to not see anything else, not that nothing else is happening, but have responses <coughs> or nothing, it seems like it's permissive to uh, perpetrators. And that's what's really painful. Um, so, you know, sometimes my job is to refer to other people, refer to CLE and RISE program, to refer to other resources, even if it just means getting food or shelter. Great, we start there. Um, and sometimes it's supporting them through the legal system, yes, and that's their choice. And sometimes it's saying, okay, I know Rachel, is, we've spoken about this too, that you know what, sometimes justice is living a good life. What can you do to survive? How can you and your individual being and in community get through? Um, so. That's what a lot of my clients are doing because they, a lot of them have not found justice in the justice system. So they're supporting each other and they come to services that know are listening to them um, and they're doing the healing work themselves which takes a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'd like to share from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we will turn the mic over to Ellen Mullally. Thank you. Firstly, thanks for the invitation to be here today and to my colleagues for presenting. It's not easy. And thanks all of you for being here and listening because it's incredibly important because this is where change starts, right? And listening to these stories. And thank you for Alyssa. Like I'm shaking just hearing, you know, what her clients go through. Really, I think my colleagues and Kinley, you know, they've really said it all today, but I just really wanted to echo the importance of those systemic <coughs> changes. So looking at alternatives like um, sexual violence courts and alternatives to what's currently pr being provided because we know it's not working for most people. Um, and there's nothing worse at our workplace. We do help a lot of people, but there's nothing worse knowing that we probably can't help that person. And we probably don't have a good place to refer them and when we're talking about living a good life and, and what they can do to carry on and survive. So when we're talking about resources um, for organizations, certainly yes, I think in the nonprofit sector that's ongoing. You know, There's always more people we can serve and always more people we can help. But I, I would really zero in on looking at those new ways of supporting victims and getting a little bit more creative um, with um, what justice could look like. That's all I'll say today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. Um, at, at this time, what we'll do is we, we have about 15 minutes for questions, um, give or take. So I'll open it up to the committee if, uh, if there's any questions at this time. Carla? Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for being here today. It's, um, I appreciated you saying, you know, take the time to breathe and process because no matter how many times you have these conversations, they don't get any easier. And, and there's always this feeling like nothing's changing. But, but what is changing is that 
more and more people are getting loud about this and more and more people are finding their inner voice and their courage and their strength and they're finding power in numbers and and here we are today and so you know where where we move forward <coughs> from here um, and I don't have a whole lot of questions because I, I'm still you know I, I think that this is a lot of um, information that that isn't necessarily new but hearing it in this presentation makes it so much um, it, t it tells like a story and and sort of where we've been and where we've come in this this flow chart is is quite something and I can't wait to look at this a little bit deeper um, one of the th questions that I have kind of stems back to, to to some work that I've been doing previously and, and just knowing the work the crucial important and challenging work of the PI Rape and Sexual Assault Center and I know that um, your mandate is to serve people uh, 16 years of age and, and older and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit where where that came from and 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 kind of just speak to that a little bit does is that mm -hmm. so. Rachel so thanks for that question Carla because what you've identified is a really big gap in services for for youth and and children on this island uh, in terms of, um, of sexual violence um, I, you know, I've, I've been at the at Pearsack for just over two years, so I can't answer the question about what the ori origin of deciding 16 plus was. Um, it was probably because that is the age of majority. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, the, where we decide a person is an adult or not is a bit of a moving line. Um, I mean, even at the age of 16, uh, around consent, you really uh, you know, technically any child under the age of 18 who's been sexually assaulted, that needs to be reported to protection, right, child protection. So, um, and other, other organizations, rape crisis centers, sexual assault centers in Canada do include, um, I think, uh, children up above the age of 12. I think under the age of 12, um, that's often referred to uh, more to mental health, child mental health <coughs> teams, and that and that's the case in PEI. We do get um, you know parents calling us saying um, my child has been assaulted. Um, what do I do? And our response, unfortunately, is there's there's not a lot of options. Really, it's the children's mental health team at. Um, at, uh, at community mental health, and uh, of course, uh, child protection services needs to be involved if they're not involved already. So there is a gap. There is a very, and we feel it keenly because we turn away a lot of not only parents but young people who are calling, who don't want their parents to know. Right? They're age 15. They've had an experience with a peer. So it's in that gray area where the, uh, the, the person who has caused harm is also uh, under the age of 18. And so there's that kind of that gray area, but they need support. They, they want to tell their story and, um, and there's very little that we can offer them. So thank you for asking that question. Carla? Thank you, Chair. It, it's devastating given we know what trauma does to you, life lifelong and and that's exactly what I ran into in trying to support people is that there was nowhere to send them with their child who had been sexually assaulted and so I guess I'm, I'm I know in the name of time I know I know there's other people that want to ask questions but I guess my my question to you is 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 that an age group that given if you had the proper resources that that you feel you would be able to support or do you see that perhaps looking a little bit differently in terms of who may provide that service? Well, as I said before, there are services across the country, uh, sexual assault services that do provide um, therapy support to that age range, um, anywhere from probably 12 and older. Uh, it does require more specialized training because you're looking at developmentally you know, different ages and different ways of intervening, but it is possible. And it could be a service that we provided given the, the proper um, 
uh, resources to do that. Thank you. Michelle. Thank you, Chair. And I can't thank you enough for being here. And I know that this, and every day must be such a heavy day for you working to uh, really We work with amazing people. I know. <laughs> but it's still, I can just imagine the heaviness that you go home with every day. And so I just want to acknowledge that. And I want to thank you for all the work that you do. And Alyssa, I want to thank you for just acknowledging just how difficult it is for somebody to walk through a door. Mm -hmm. and thank you for what you do. So I'm going to ask two really quick questions, and that doesn't usually come from me, but, but I think that you've given us so much information here that um, there's a lot for us to mull over and work on. So you had mentioned the, sex, the sex, Sexual Violence Prevention and Public Education Coordinator pilot. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what department that sits in and what was the justification for it? Like, how did, I'm sure that you'd had to fight just to get a pilot. And so what was the justification about it not being important to have that you had to ask for a pilot first before to prove that it was necessary? So I, I think, do, you, do I need to, like, do you need to let them know to turn my mic on? <laughs> Rachel, I was, I just slipped up there for a second. Okay. My phone, I'm used to chairing meetings, too, yes. so. <laughs> so thank you, Gordon. Um, so the, the pilot money came from the Interministerial Women's Secretariat, the Violence Against Women grant. And uh, I think, uh, historically, PeerSAC has uh, and maybe it's this is just in very recent years has had to I know that there was a volunteer cadre of uh, folks that answered the crisis line there used to be a crisis line uh, when the island helpline came in it was asked you know it was determined that that particular specialized uh, line wasn't re required anymore um, and I think because it along with a lot of other sexual assault services in the country, was not adequately funded to do anything but focus on, on responding. So providing intervention for survivors, providing uh, counseling support. Um, but that's only a very small, as you, you know, can gather by this, is a very, uh, pr intervention is a part of prevention, but there's a whole lot more that we need to do to work upstream, as they say, to stop the numbers of people that are coming to our door. And an important part of that is the education and awareness raising that we can do in the community. So we started with uh, Take Back the Night. I've been uh, ED since 2019. We started with a Take Back the Night uh, the first year. Uh, this year, we combined that with Sexual Assault Awareness Week. And now we're, we're hoping to increase the um, our prevention strategies by having this sexual violence prevention and education coordinator and very grateful for the funding the grant for that to get it going uh, because that's often the way that we begin to show the need and the benefits for services is to, is to have a pilot so um, I've already seen the benefits in other areas of having this kind of uh, coordinator and um, and so that's why I'm, I'm saying we should really consider this as a permanent position. So thank you. Thank you Michelle. Thank you. Um, I think my other question then is what you just mentioned upstream, and I, we hear that word an awful lot, and I fear that it'll be the new buzzword, but not actually taking action and actually doing stuff upstream, just talking about it. Mm -hmm. and, one really crucial place that we need to start addressing is in our education system. And um, have you had any um, meetings or have you had any work with the Department of Education of how can we um, change? Because it's not working. Like what we're talking about here, it's not getting better. I don't, I don't think it's getting better. Um, I'm not hearing that it is. So in order to make it better, we have to like put it into our education system and really fundamentally change. And so have you had any discussions or is there, has there been any opposition to really structurally changing how we educate on this? So 
I don't mind Rachel? answering that. So that's a really great question also, Michelle. And uh, there is work being done in the schools. And um, as being a member of the Premier's Action Committee on Family Violence Prevention, uh, we have some working groups, and one of those is um, the Sexual Violence uh, Prevention or Response Working Group uh, with uh, who um, uh, Michelle harris Gange, who's the director of uh, IWS, uh, which is now IWS, IWS falls under Education and Lifelong Learning, so it's kind of a very happy marriage of lifelong learning, I think, and uh, the... Um, uh, the, the minister responsible for the status of women. And um, so that committee uh, started working on this very issue even before I joined it. And, uh, and Kinley actually uh, provided um, uh, a, you know, um, the possibility of using one of her songs uh, uh, called Microphone, which created what was called the Microphone Project. And maybe, Kinley, you can talk a little bit more about that. It's, I can't remember what age group it's targeted at. Kinley? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, the committee made this incredible curriculum um, for, I think it's grade nine, nine health, yeah, grade nine health progr programs across PEI. Um, and they talk about consent and bystanders and, um, and just sexual assault and, and they, they, it was amazing. They used my music video and the lyrics and they kind of study everything and, and uh, and gender norms, that was the other thing that they studied. And anyway, it was like the most amazing committee I've, uh, and I was honored that they, they asked me to like use my music. And, and I, I think it's having, I've heard that some teachers are like, I don't know how to teach this. So, but I know that there's a lot of amazing teachers out there, there that are doing such a great job um, with it. And yeah, I think I'm just so honored to be part of this movement. And there's so many amazing people in PEI pushing for stuff like this. So. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great, Jane Lebel. And I would just note that there are um, there are, there are lots of groups across the island that have been doing really great work in creating curriculum resources that can support teachers to to talk about healthy relationships and consent in the classroom, um, and that there's space being made within the curriculum where you can kind of fit that in, um, and where there's like a where the curriculum has outcomes that are, require that um, that there are that there's learning about consent and about healthy relationships, and that that's growing. Um, the Purple Ribbon Campaign that we coordinate from the Advisory Council on the Status of Women has also created resources for teachers um, that are you know available uh, that support the curriculum and that include consent and healthy relationships and supporting survivors and and other themes like the violence prevention and violence response that uh, that that we, we hope are, are used well and taken up within classrooms. Rachel? And I'll just add uh, to, to conclude that the sexual violence prevention and public education coordinator would be an additional response because as um, you know, as was mentioned, not every teacher is comfortable talking about this mm -hmm. subject. So to have a like a subject matter expert to support or to do the or to lead the module uh, would, I think, be a very valuable resource for those teachers that aren't that comfortable or feel confident. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I just respond? I know I said yeah. I just respond. And that's Michelle? exactly where I was getting to. So often we put so much pressure on teachers to educate where they may not even have the skill set or the tools available to them, and it puts them in a very difficult situation. And t I'm happy to hear that there's that support because not everybody's in the same space, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll soon we'll get there. But you know, it often falls on the shoulders of the teachers in the classroom, and that's very challenging for them because they could also be people who are dealing with their own trauma. And we don't recognize that, that we are everywhere, and mm -hmm. we put a lot of pressure on their shoulders. So I'm glad to hear that that would be something that this pilot would also be involved in. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Zach Bell. Thank you, Chair. Um, and just to kind of touch on the same things that Michelle uh, had uh, reached on, she kind of asked a few of my questions, but I, I do have one specific, and I do also want to thank everyone for providing this information, first of all, and for providing your first-hand accounts. It's, it's very helpful. Um, I, I do agree that 
um, the position that the Sexual Violence Prevention Public Education Coordinator should be a permanent position. I, I do think that the, you know, the, the more knowledge that you can give previously is so much beneficial. And the reason why I say that is I do have a daughter and I do coach my daughter's teams and I've coached many young girls and the stat that you mentioned about the one in three women will experience sexual assault, that really stood out to me. Um, especially the fact that when I look around the dressing room of a girls team that I coach and there's 17 girls in the room, right? So um, my question, I guess, and it's kind of Michelle touched on it, but, and I really only have one quick question, but if that position was to be a permanent um, position, what other things do you, would you see that this person do to uh, essentially promote that publication or public education piece. I can send you, send you the job description. <laughs> it's just been, it's actually on our website. It's It's been posted. Okay. Um, but some of the other things that they would do is, um, I mean, it's, it's, it would be a, a job in development as well. So we would be responding to requests from the general public uh, to, I mean, I think it's really valuable to, uh, Talk to teams, talk to coaches, absolutely. Um, one of the other boards that I sit on is uh, the board of EVA Canada, which is Ending Violence Association Canada, which currently works with the CFL uh, to address gender-based violence within that organization. And since uh, the CFL has started to work with us, they have adopted a, uh, a, zero, pol a zero tolerance policy. So they will not hire players now that have um, a history of gender-based violence. We're also on a retainer uh, so that if there is an incident of gender-based violence that happens with one of their team members, um, we'll go in and do critical incident intervention. Um, and we, we also do training. Like, uh, we're not just doing intervention, we're doing prevention training, so uh, awareness raising and so on with, with team members. So we've got our sights on hockey players next. <laughs> but the CFL, I mean, that is, that's very gratifying work because that's a, that's a big part of that, that culture, right? That locker room banter that we talk about um, that supports what happens further up on that pyramid. That's good, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Lund. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for being here. This is a difficult conversation. I'm the justice critic for the opposition and I've been in contact with a number of your organizations and a lot of these individuals on all different things. Um, I'm gonna head in a different direction than the questions that have been asked so far. I hear in your presentation, Rachel, that when you were speaking to the Charlottetown police, they said there were very few reports of drug facilitated sexual assault and I think the women in this room hear a disconnect with that based on our experiences. We all know people who, I assume we all know people who have been drugged. We have all heard these stories. So there's clearly a disconnect between what is getting filtered into the police and what we know is happening in the community. And I see a huge problem there. So I suppose I see two, two gaps we need to figure out how we're gonna filter that information to the police and then we need to know they're gonna do something with it as a starting point. I know when I review the information on uh, the, the policies that are supposed to be followed in order to press charges, it doesn't look like we should be determining that we're not gonna go ahead and investigate because we don't expect we will get a charge. It seems like you would have to have an investigation first before you can determine whether or not there is enough evidence to pursue a charge. So that feels, that feels backwards from my perspective. And I'm just curious if you have comments on that or if there are any other crimes that you can think of that we determine we will not be pursuing charges before we have done an investigation. <laughs> does, does this feel backwards to just me? Rachel? Yeah. So um, I think you've identified the, the problem very clearly. That's one of the, um, what I perceive is, a, is, is a, you know, a huge problem in that I'm, you know, I can't read the police minds, but I am guessing that they probably think in their minds that, you know, there is really no point in going ahead and 
investing, investigating a crime. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort, a lot of time and resources to properly investigate um, a crime. When they know, they're probably playing judge and jury in their minds that, like, why would, why would I bother? I mean, they may not be thinking this out loud in their heads, but I'm guessing that there's, there's probably some narrative in the background saying, why would I bother? you know, to invest a lot of time in this when, and possibly re-traumatize the victim uh, when it's not going to go anywhere. Because we know statistically that when it goes up the chain in the justice system, there's the barrier at the Crown and there's also the barrier at, in the courts as well. And so, uh, yes, we still need to do work with police, absolutely, because they're they're doing that judgment that is not in their purview. Their job is to investigate and to take uh, to take our complaints seriously. So there's you know there's often a correlation between sexual assault reports and somebody who reports like a bank robbery or a personal robbery. That if somebody went in and said I've been robbed, they're going to take that seriously. They're going to investigate and so on. Someone else, a woman goes in and says I've been sexually assaulted. I've I've heard survivors say that as soon as the police starts hearing their story, they're basically closing their notebook and putting it back in their pocket, you know? So, uh, and I just want to clarify one, th one statement that you made, um, when, or, or the, the statement that, I, that you referred to. When I said that police were reporting uh, that they had received very few complaints, I was not just saying that that was Charlottetown Police. There were other services there at that meeting. And that actually came from someone who was not uh, Charlottetown police. So I just want to um, clarify that. Very quickly, follow up. Thank what? you, Chair. I appreciate that clarification. <coughs> I will try to be quick on this point. But when we're talking about date rape drugs in particular, apart from all other types of sexualized violence, it is my opinion, and based on what I've heard from a lot of people who have experienced drugging, it does not seem that someone who is purchasing date rape drugs has decided to do this as a one-off. I cannot help but see this as a public safety issue. Even if we do not have enough evidence to pursue um, charges for one individual when they come forward, I think if we're looking at the systemic nature of the fact that this individual is very likely to try this again if he was successful, mm -hmm. that there is a public safety component involved in an investigation Absolutely. that may not have anything to do with whether or not I can get a conviction on an individual's case alone. And I feel like this is where I'm seeing a huge gap that if I don't do that investigation, I don't have the opportunity to connect the dots between multiple cases that could be related. I don't have the opportunity to issue a statement letting people know that at this particular bar there's been multiple cases. I don't have an opportunity to offer training perhaps to the staff who work there that this is going on and that means that when you've now evicted someone from the premises because you believe they are drunk, you may be putting them at extreme risk. It feels like there's a huge gap that that happens when we don't investigate this, and I'm just curious if that is reflected in the work that you're doing, if you're also hearing that gap and those that lack of connected dots. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Rachel, yeah. So um, I, I would just draw your attention back to uh, one of these slides that around drug-assisted sexual assault, that there's the proactive and there's the opportunistic. And I think both of those need to be addressed. So it's not just about drugs. Yes, that does indicate predatory behavior, absolutely. But there's also predatory behavior in opportunistic. So you know, there are people there, mostly men, who will go to bars. And I mean, you know, you hear people telling jokes about, oh, let's go to bars and pick up drunk girls, you know? Those are people taking advantage with intent, right? And so, yes, I think it is a very much a public safety issue. I think all gender-based violence is a public safety issue. When you just look statistically, this is an epidemic, right? We're in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a, of a pandemic of sorts with, with COVID, but that's also, you know, the pandemic of gender-based violence has been around a lot longer. Forever. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
just in conclusion, um, I want to say that to the victims, um, we believe you, and you, you as advocates today have brought such a light on their behalf, and I know there's some watching. And um, like you said, that's a place that we have to start. Um, we have to look at policies, prevention, and resources in the community. But we also have to look, and men have to look at men. And um, this committee will take this issue extremely serious. And we will talk about this, and we will report back to the legislature in the spring session. Um, I'm sure we'll have a good deliberation, but I want to thank Kinley, Jane, Rachel, Sarah, Ellen, Alicia, and Kathy for coming in and doing such a good job today. So um, I'm just going to conclude this section of this meeting, and then we'll have a quick transition, and then we'll bring in our next group. But thank you very much. Thank you very much thank for you. coming in today. Okay. We'll adjourn for five minutes.
So we're back for the fourth section in our meeting. So we're uh, continuing on with the, the same theme. We're going to get a, uh, a briefing um, on the incident from the Shaw Town from the, the um, from the police commissioner, and I'll pass it over to to you both, and then you can introduce yourself and and then uh, c continue on with your presentations, and we'll save questions to the end. That last presentation went a little bit longer, so um, we'll just keep that in mind, um, and as well. There'll just be a little transition. If you want to uh, say something, just put your hand up and I'll, I'll identify you when that comes. I'll start. Yes. My name is Cindy Wedge and I'm the police commissioner. Seated with me is Phil Pitts. Mr. Pitts is the investigator and manager for the office of the police commissioner. What you are seeing here is the entirety of the office of the police commissioner. There is not an administrative or institutional structure behind the work that we do. We are the entirety of the Office of the Police Commissioner. Before I start my comments, I thought you should all be aware that the reporter who investigated and initially reported on the drug tampering, Kate McKenna, is my daughter. Um, some of you may be aware of that already, but I like to be quite transparent about that. Now, when Kate was working on the story, the executive producer that she works for at CBC instructed her not to discuss her work with me because it could conceivably come into conflict with the Office of the Police Commissioner. So there were protective walls put in place to maintain the integrity of the work that we both do, but I thought you should be aware of the family relationship at the outset. Now, I struggled to understand how the work done by, I'm going to call it the OPC, Office of the Police Commissioner, how the work that we do could be of benefit to you in your discussions and your deliberations afterwards. So I went online, and thankfully all of these meetings are video recorded, and there's a library of them, and I watched the recording of your last meeting where you decided you wanted to hear from us. And based on what I heard during that meeting, and Mr. Henderson, I heard you say loud and clear, you do not want a significant lecture on criminal law. I heard that. <laughs> but I thought based on what I heard, I would frame a number of questions and give you the answers to those questions in the hope that it may be of assistance. This presentation is going to be much shorter than the last presentation that you heard. We all heard the passion and the commitment from the presenters that we heard previously. This one's going to be a lot um, more technical, if I can put it that way. So let's start from the perspective of exactly what does the OPC do? What is the work that our office does? And there are three general areas where we do work. We provide, number one, civilian oversight to complaints by individual islanders against individual police officers. Okay? And we have certain police agencies over which we have jurisdiction. Summerside Police Service, Charlottetown Police Service, Kensington Police Service, the Conservation Officers, the UPEI Security Service, and the staff at the Atlantic Police Academy. So those are where we have what we call areas of jurisdiction. We have nothing to do with the RCMP. They have their own complaints process. So that's the first thing that we do. We provide civilian oversight. The second thing that we do, the Attorney General is ultimately responsible for policing in the province. He issues documents called directives to police agencies saying, here's how I would like you to do your work. It's on everything from the types of training you have to have to be a police officer, to the kind of security clearance you have to pass to be a police officer, to the kinds of um, communication and records management systems police agencies have to have in the province so that they can communicate with each other. Once a year, Mr. Pitts goes to each police agency and does a review to ensure that the police agencies are all compliant with those directives. Then we file an annual report that encapsulates all of that. So that's the second thing that our office does. So we provide civilian oversight, we conduct reviews, and the third thing is there's this catch-all section in the Police Act that says that the police commissioner shall perform such other duties as directed by either the attorney general or the lieutenant governor and council. So for example, that section's been used 
where the serious incident response team has had to come into the province to conduct investigations. We've been assigned the responsibility to oversee those investigations. If there's a particularly identified problem in a, an agency, we can be asked to investigate it, those kinds of things. So those are the three areas that the Office of the Police Commissioner covers. That's the first question. The next question I framed is, does the OPC have the legislative authority to perform a review of the manner in which a police agency responds to a specific type of complaint? That, by the way, is called a service audit. So if there's a complaint that a police agency isn't taking drug tampering cases seriously or impaired driving seriously or something of that nature, do we have the legislative authority to do that general wholesale review? The answer is no, we do not. As I told you, we have the authority to conduct, per, to provide civilian oversight of complaints by individuals against individual police officers. We don't do those kinds of systemic reviews. The only way we would have the authority is if it was a specific direction from either the Attorney General or the Lieutenant Governor and Council. But there is a reason why I told you that Mr. Pitts and I are the entirety of the Office of the Police Commissioner. Currently, we don't have the resource capacity to conduct a service review of that nature. We would have to contract with an outside agency to perform it, and funding would be required for that. So the next question that I framed that I thought might be of assistance to you is, are there currently offenses in the criminal code to address drink tampering? The answer is yes, there are. Uh, section 245 of the code creates the offense of administra administering a noxious thing. This is the only part of the criminal code I'm going to read to you. But the first words of that section read, every person who administers or causes to be administered to any other person or causes any other person to take poison or any other destructive or noxious thing is guilty of an offense. A noxious thing is any substance that can, that can bring about bodily harm and, of course, sexual assault is bodily harm. If the drink tampering is for purposes of perpetrating a sexual assault, the individual administering the drug could also be charged with sexual assault under the code. And consent, of course, is not present if the complainant is unconscious or is incapable of consenting to the sexual activity. Now. What is the standard of proof required to attain a conviction? The Crown must be able to establish beyond a reasonable doubt the guilt of the accused. Now, I've certainly heard the comments you just heard about the criminal justice system from the previous presenters, and I'm sure you've heard the words beyond a reasonable doubt many, many times before. But in the criminal justice system, those words have significant substantive meaning. In layman terms, it means the judge must be sure before the accused can be convicted. Now, this is hard to get your head around, but even if the judge believes the complainant, that is not sufficient. If the judge believes a different version of events could reasonably be true. So think about that for a minute. The judge must be sure there can be no other reasonable explanation for what transpired. Now, it's important to note the Canadian criminal justice system has three cornerstones. They are the requirement for proof beyond a reasonable doubt, the right to remain silent. My mind has gone blank. Well, it happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, the right to remain silent, Innocence. And the presumption of innocence, sorry, the presumption of innocence. It doesn't matter if the criminal charge is impaired driving or murder or sexual assault. The rules are the same. So the next question I framed is, what are the types of evidence police may need to gather in a drink tampering or sexual assault investigation? Every situation is unique and different and the police determine what steps they need to take based on the information that they have in their possession. So what I'm about to outline are just some examples of the types of evidence that the police gather in the course of their investigation. 
Of course, they get statements from the complainant and from all the witnesses. They would get the results of a rape kit that is performed in an emergency room in a hospital. They would seize, examine, and send for DNA typing to a forensic lab any clothing or other materials seized in the course of the investigation. That can be sheets, pillowcases, clothing, all of the things that people may have come into contact with. There is possible DNA evidence from bodily substances that are obtained from the person of the complainant. I'm assuming you all know what that means. I don't need to describe that further. If, if a rape kit's done on a complainant, and if a DNA is found on that individual that is not that individual's own um, um, bodily substance, and if there is a suspect and the police have grounds, they can get a warrant to get DNA from the suspect, so they can a DNA sample, so they can send that to a lab to have it compared with what was found on the person of the victim for comparison purposes. There's a possible search of the residence of the suspect. There's any video available of the places where the complainant and suspect frequented on the night of the incident. And there's such other evidence as may be available from the unique circumstances. I think I heard Dr. Crowder say that um, there is a, a, a great deal of police work that needs to go into these investigations. And I think that's what I've tried to outline for you, some of it. So what happens when the police investigation is completed? Now the procedure I'm about to outline, my history, I was previously um, in prosecutions before I became the police commissioner. This is the process that was in place when I was in prosecutions. It could well have changed now, but this was how we managed them. Um, the, the investigating officer completes his investigation. He takes his entire file to the Crown the Crown reviews the entire file. They have a discussion about whether there's any further evidence that could possibly be obtained. And the Crown then reviews the evidence and makes a determination whether there is a reasonable likelihood of conviction of the offense. If there is a reasonable likelihood, the officer is told and the charges are laid. If there is not a reasonable likelihood, then the officer is advised that no charges should be laid. So, if there's not a reasonable likelihood the officer is advised, no charges should be laid. Why is that the test? There is a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is the court experience is challenging. It's onerous on, on complainants. You would not want to put a complainant through that process unless such a reasonable likelihood existed. Court is not therapy, and, and that needs to be understood. It's, it's a difficult experience for any woman or man. I've prosecuted sexual offenses with both male and female victims. I've seen um, the reactions when the outcome is a not guilty finding. Uh, um, it, as I say, court is not therapy. That's the first reason because you don't want to put someone through that unless there's a reasonable likelihood of a certain outcome. The second is in our justice system, if you prosecute when there is not a reasonable likelihood of conviction, that is seen as persecution and not prosecution. So that's why the stat test is so high. Now that's the background information that I thought I would provide to you. When <clears throat> I watched the video of your last meeting, I was trying to get my head around what exactly is the question that this committee is trying to answer. Is, what, what's the specific question? Is it, can anything be done about the series of situations that occurred in 2010, 2011, that was documented in the media reports? Is that your question? Or is the question, is there anything this committee can do so that in the future these situations are handled differently? And I heard Dr. Crowder give you a series of recommendations as to what you can do differently. She's certainly far more experienced in that area than I. But let's start with the question of, can anything be done about the allegations from 2010, 2011? It's impossible for me to answer that question because number one, I am unfamiliar with the specifics of the allegations that have been made. And let me tell you, 
uh, with a lot of experience, you do not give an opinion on those files until you've read every sentence of every paragraph of every page. So I don't know the information to answer that. But secondly, it's always possible that the Office of the Police Commissioner will be called upon to perform one of its functions in relation to one of these complaints. So I cannot express an opinion that might create a reasonable apprehension of bias. So I can't answer that question for you. So the second question is, is there anything the Standing Committee can do to have these situations handled differently in the future? And Mr. Henderson, I'm not meaning to pick on you, but once again, I heard, I heard you ask the question, is there some kind of a legislative amendment that we can propose in order to maybe change some outcomes? Criminal law falls under federal jurisdiction, and only the Government of Canada can legislate in that area. As I said, the basics of criminal law, presumption of innocence, right to remain silent, and the need for proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Those apply to all criminal offenses. So from the perspective of legislation, I do not believe there's anything that the government of PEI can change, not in terms of the substantive proof of the offenses that would be charged for this type of behavior. As I said, my presentation was much smarter, shorter. That completes it. But I'd be pleased to answer any questions anyone may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Wedge. Um, uh, uh, committee is. Uh, it's at your disposal to ask any questions, so we'll start with Carla. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being here today. Um, I guess in trying to figure <coughs> out our questions, recognizing that you know this, that your scope is very limited, and so I guess my first question would be: Do you see any value in? And, and you had also mentioned how obviously you know you're you're kind of maxed in terms of what what you can handle in terms of resources and and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering. I guess this is kind of a two-part question. Do you see value in kind of widening the scope of the commissioner, and, and what resources do you see you, you may need in that? The Office of the Police Commissioner was created in 2010 for a specific function. The primary function was civilian oversight of individual complaints against individuals. Uh, do I see a need to widen the scope? No, because I think the tools are there to um, fulfill our current legislative mandate. So I don't see a need to widen that scope. Whether the scope, whether there are different responsibilities that government would like to see the office take on, that would be a policy decision to be made. So I don't think I'm in a position to comment on that. But if it was expanded, the resources would have to be increased. To give you an idea of how we work, Mr. Pitts works 20 hours a week. And I try to limit my involvement to about two hours a week, but it's been substantially more than that recently, just because of things like this and other public engagements. Carla? Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I'm wondering. And, how many complaints um, have been filed with your office uh, in terms of kind of civilian complaints against police officers who they feel did not handle their their situation properly or they had kind of some personal complaints in, in regards to, to the specific um, time frame of the druggings? Are you talking, how many complaints have we had about drink tampering? Yeah. Is that is that your question? Because well, it's, I mean, we cover complaints. Police officers have to follow a code of conduct. So we can have complaints about everything from the officer pulled me over and he was rude to me. So I, I need to understand exactly what your question is. Well, I guess maybe I'm not understanding the scope of kind of what, what sort of complaints would come into you. So what sort of complaints would you be dealing with from civilians? If we if we consider this specific topic and time frame, what what might be some or or even if you want to make it more general, what would be some complaints that that you may receive or could potentially receive? You, Mr. Pitts will answer that. Um, there's a broad broad range of complaints that we received. They they could range from like the commissioner said, someone was rude to me, someone used excessive force, someone. Uh, didn't have proper authority to arrest me. Uh, the police 
were disrespectful when I made a complaint. They didn't, they didn't understand my complaint or they, they dismissed me. Uh, it's a broad range of things. Okay. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And so, um, I guess, does that... I guess if I could be specific on what the topic is today, we've, we've had one complaint uh, that concerned uh, drink, drink tampering and the police's attitude. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That, was, that was my question. Okay. Um, and so when, when a case is determined to be unfounded, um, does, does the police commissioner have any involvement at all in these sorts of reviews? Okay. No. Carla? Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I, I'm going to, I'll leave it for now if other people have questions and then I, sure. I may get back on the list. Michelle? Great. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for being here. Um, so, Commissioner, did you say that you, you, you try to limit your time to two hours? Is that a week? Is that, so what's the scope of the police commissioner's role if that doesn't exactly sound like, you know, I guess I don't understand. Um, so the police commissioner's work hours. Okay. Maybe you can explain that to me sure. because I, I find that kind of surprising. The, the phrase I used was we provide civilian oversight to complaints against police officers. That word oversight is very important. We do not process the complaints at first instance ourselves. We facilitate the processing of those complaints. So if, if, let's say you have an interaction with a police officer that, that you believe is contrary to their code of conduct, you can file a complaint with our office, or you can file a complaint with the chief officer of the police agency where that police officer is employed, okay? If it comes into our office, we send your complaint to the chief officer. The police agent, it's, it's a complex process. These, the police agencies all have professional standards officers, so the chief would give it to the professional standards officer. He would investigate your complaint. He would file a report with the chief. The chief would examine that, that um, professional standards officer's report, make a finding as to whether or not that police officer is deserving of discipline. If he, and he will communicate his, his result back to the person who filed the complaint. If the person who receives that is dissatisfied with it, they can then apply to the Office of the Police Commissioner for a review. We would then conduct a review. We can um, attempt to resolve the complaint. We have a number of mechanisms we can follow up to and including sending the complaint to an independent adjudication. So, so when I say I try to limit the time in the <coughs> office, it's, it's basically not to waste taxpayers' money, to work in an efficient way. Michelle? <coughs> I just had something caught in my throat. Sorry. It's okay. Um, okay. <coughs> Sorry, Chair, I might have to no, scoot over no a glass of water. But, um, so is the scope of the police commissioner in Prince Edward Island similar to other jurisdictions, or is there different... Um, different things that the commissioner's office would do in those jurisdictions? Every, every province is different. Um, I'm, I'm relatively new to this. Mr. Pitts may be better positioned to answer this than I am. Um, there, there, like the commissioner said, there are different uh, setups in different provinces. We have a police commissioner. Some provinces have police commissions, which is a, uh, a body of three or four people that would hear the, all the, the complaints and make decisions on discipline, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's really two different types of uh, oversight bodies. There's a civilian oversight that deals with code of conduct, and a lot of provinces have a separate group which deals with serious incidents, such as uh, bodily harm, death, or sexual assault by a peace officer. And they're totally different set up and different governance for those different groups. But yes, there's as many different uh, uh, police oversight agencies and, and uh, mandates as there are governments in Canada. Michelle? Okay, thank you. Um, so, 
I guess I'm going to go to a police if somebody has a complaint and they're filing a complaint, especially if it's a um, somebody who has experienced trauma. That whole yeah. experience of going through that police um, investigation in the first place and the reporting and all of that, um, we've heard from the group that was here prior, extremely difficult to, just to open that door, just to open up that conversation. Um, and then if they don't feel like they've gotten um, their their complaint um, resolved to how they would expect it to to have pro proceeded, the, they would then file another complaint with the same police department of how they were treated during that investigation. And it's only if they go through that process then that they would ask for the police commissioner to review that complaint. Is that that's correct. Mm, that's that's quite a process for somebody who's experienced yeah. trauma to go through. Not really conducive of creating an environment that that's actually going to happen. It's the manner in which it's structured in the Police Act. The Police Act is the legislation that creates the office of the police commissioner and that sets out the manner in which we are to <coughs> perform our function. Okay. Um, sure. One more, and I'll let somebody else go, and then I'll get back on the list, Chair. So once we get to... So you, you had mentioned that um, if there was anything that should be changed in response to what Robbie had mentioned in our last meeting, that this is as a result of the criminal um, legal system, which is a federal, um, federal law, so that would have to be done through federal lawmakers, but the actual justice for Prince Edward Island is provincial. It's provincial jurisdiction. And that's the administration of justice, yes. Yes. And so I, I know this answer, I'll just point blank ask you, has the Attorney General um, put out a directive for the Office of the Police Commissioner to conduct um, a service audit of the police response to, to drink tampering? No, we do have no such directive. Okay. Has there ever been a directive, to your knowledge, from the Auditor General of Prince Edward Island to do such a review uh, under any circumstances? From the Attorney General? Yeah. Auditor, yeah, Attorney General. Because that's who, or the Lieutenant Council. Uh, your, your question is, have we ever received a directive mm -hmm. to conduct a service audit on drink tamper? Is that your question? And you said no to that, but I, then I asked, has there ever been? Um, a directive for any audit by the police commissioner on his office, police commissioner's office. Just, just they, they issue directives on, on training, uh, job requirements, that sort of thing, but not on, we don't do an audit of actual investigations. That's not in our mandate. Just one final. Okay. Yeah, one final. And so just so that I'm clear, if you are hearing or if there is reports, you know, in the media or anything like that of something that would maybe raise concern because there's been several cases of it happening, there would never be an instance in which the Office of the Police Commissioner would initiate their own investigation. I said the Office of the Police Commissioner and the role of the Police Commissioner is created in the Police Act. The Police Act sets out what we can and cannot do. We cannot exceed what the, picture it as a fence around what we can do. We cannot exceed our jurisdiction. We can only do what the Police Act authorizes us to do. We do not have the authority to initiate a complaint ourselves. There must be a member of the public who initiates a complaint. So what you're describing, we don't have the authority to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Rob? Uh, yeah, thanks. And I have to admit uh, a very succinct presentation. And I find that rather refreshing. Uh, <laughs> very, very clear. So it's sort of a little intimidating to not ask a question <laughs> uh, with that kind of, a, of uh, answers coming back. But uh, cause we, we, we in the political sphere tend to be a little more gray as versus black and white, right? <laughs> so, so uh, but anyway, one, one question that did kind of come up, and you'd mentioned that the RCMP is not under your jurisdiction in any capacity, but, but I'm raising the 
question about the RCMP has a contract with the Department of Justice to provide um, policing services to those that don't have policing services. You've mentioned quite a list of a few municipalities in the UPI and whatnot. Um, so, is 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 there is that is that not a reason why maybe we should like the Minister of Justice should be outlining to have that under? the police commission too? I mean, I mean, you may have to have the more resources to kind of oversee that, but that would be probably 90% of the geographical region of the province that would be under the RCMP. And I'm just trying to get a better sense of how those uh, police officers are protected from, you know, by having a commission that can verify and, and create all the facts, but uh, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. Is there, should that be under the commission or and as part of the contract, or should what is the process that the RCMP goes through under the same circumstances? The RCMP have their own civilian complaints process. Mm -hmm. As to the details of the contract between the government of PEI and the government of Canada for the provision of RCMP services, I can't answer your question. Mm. Rob? But I, I sort of look at it as uh, should it maybe, well, I know you can't technically answer that, but I'm kind of questioning whether it should be included in the contract that it falls under the police commissioner because, you know, we, we, want, we want some standards in, in the processes that unfold uh, all across Prince Edward Island. And, uh, and I, I know that's more of an opinion I'm asking you to do. And, and by your answer so far, they're very succinct and, and uh, very black and white. So you may not have that answer. But I just kind of wanted to make that statement to sort of say that, that is that something that we as legislators can uh, uh, instruct the uh, Minister of Justice to review that and see if that makes sense? Uh, that would be the only answer we could do. Once again, that's a government yeah. policy decision. Right. So it's more of a policy answer. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, we have Michelle on the list. Uh, yeah. No, I'm okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> I just have a question about, uh, to, to, to wrap up about, so UPI, for example, it's UPI. There's there's student police there. Um, did the, the no, there's security police. Sec not not the student police we knew when we were back in university. Okay. The guys with the bands around their arm. Those yeah. days are over. Okay. 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 And they're security police officers. Se security. So they're they're actual police officers on campus. Under the police act, they're called security police, but they are required to be compliant with the directives of the attorney general. So they have to have all the basic training use of force, first aid, all the areas of training, they're required to have all those areas of training. No firearms. They, they, don't, they, don't, carry they fire. don't carry firearms. No firearms. Yeah. And the only reason I'm asking is because in the last presentation we looked at a, the majority of, of issues that were happening were happening at a younger age. I just want to make sure that, that the students are protected on campus and then when they leave, if they go to like a Browns Court or something, that's a different jurisdiction. Um, so I was just kind of seeing if you could talk to that a little bit. I know you're hearing from the Charlottetown Police Service on Friday. I know that there are agreements in place between the university and the Charlottetown Police Service as to what matters university, the, the security police might investigate, like theft from lockers and that kind of thing, mm. and what matters they move on to the Charlottetown Police yeah. Service. But the Charlottetown Police Service is better positioned to answer your question. Yeah, and all. But, but uh, the, at the root of your question, I think, is a concern that perhaps if it was a drink tampering or a sexual assault allegation, uh, the university is a robust, or a robust police services brought in to address that situation. I believe the answer to that question is yes. Yeah. But others can better answer that. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and I'll, I'll okay. bring that up with, with them on Friday. Um, uh, Carol? Just one last question. Um, I'm wondering, I know that the complaints process typically is, is kind of, um, survivors would have 12 months to come forward if they wanted to file a complaint. And I'm wondering if in a case like this, if, if there were a survivor that, that had been, had survived um, drugging back in 2010, given, I know that there are special circumstances where in the, if it's in the public interest or, um, you know, depending on circumstances of the events, sometimes they will allow people to to um, to register complaints. Is is that is that something that survivors have the would have the opportunity to do now if they wanted to come forward now with with any complaints about um, the handling of of their um, 
We would look at the time that had elapsed between the incident and when the complaint was brought forward. Then we would look at the Act for the legislative direction as to what are the rules that we are required to follow. And it's, it's 12 months or it can be longer and I would want to look at the Act to make sure I'm properly quoting the language. I would look at that language and look at what are the reasons for the delay and a determination would be made after considering all the factors. When you use language like in a case such as this, that can encompass so many different sets of circumstances, a general answer to that question is, is dangerous. And I'm not trying to be vague in my responses, but every situation's unique, and you have to look at every situation as a unique situation and make the best decision based on the information that's in your possession. Mark? speak to the role of that professional, professional standards officer sure. within the, the departments and what their role is? Because they're, they're kind of below you, you folks, okay. so to speak. Well, no, they're below the chief. They're not below yeah, us. Yes. Yeah, okay. We don't supervise or direct any police yeah. agency. That's like, that's people who watch Blue Bloods, forget that. It's <laughs> not like that at all, right? Yeah. Um, no, the, the professional standards officer works for the chief. Mm -hmm. And, and as I told, Mr. Pitts is the, off, is the manager and investigator in our office. You may be better positioned to answer that for him sure. than I can. Sure. Um, the professional standards officer would basically take the complaint, they would investigate it, make a report to the chief on whether what their belief is mm -hmm. with a recommendation. Um, but they, de they deal with their, with their standards for their police service and the police act. So in, the, in this situation, if we're keep referring to the specific, sure. uh, you know, situation. So that would be their first course of re recourse if, if they felt that their complaint, their complaint wasn't handled properly or with enough, Well, you if, know, if, would, would if they weren't that? satisfied with the, way, with the police, not necessarily with a whole bunch of things yeah. about the police or whatever their complaint was, yeah. they can make, as the commissioner said, they can make a complaint to the police chief or they can make it to our office. If we get it, the police act mandates that we send it to the chief to investigate. So then he gives it to the professional standard officer who would investigate it. He would make his report to the chief. The chief would uh, make a decision, either dismiss it or he could impose discipline. Then either the complainant or the respondent, if there was discipline imposed, can ask the police commissioner's office to review it. That's where, that's where we would step in then. Great. Uh, Michelle? Thanks, Chair. Um, so I'm just looking for clarity on something that we discussed a few minutes ago. So am I understanding correctly that police agencies, are, as the investigative agencies, are ultimately responsible for laying charges in, to an offense such as drink tampering? Is it ultimately the police agency? Okay. Um, I have to put on my former prosecutor's hat mm -hmm. rather than my police commissioner's hat. Prince Edward Island is not a pre-charge screening jurisdiction. Okay. Um, in some provinces, the Crown must approve the laying of charges before charges are laid. That is not the situation on Prince Edward Island. The police have the authority to lay charges. And there's a very clear line between what the police responsibility is and what the Crown responsibility is. Now, with sexual assaults, there have been policies over the years, and I'm not sure of the current state of policy, but on sexual assaults and sexual offenses, the police agencies would engage in a consultation with the Crown prior to the laying of charges. Here's the reason for that, and this is criminal law, I'm sorry, but the grounds for the police to lay a charge are reasonable grounds to believe that an offense has been committed. The test for the Crown to proceed with the charge is a reasonable likelihood of conviction, which is a higher standard. So there's that gray area in between. So conceivably, and this is just conceivably, you could have a police officer laying a charge and the Crown going right in behind him and staying it, which doesn't make the administration of justice look very good. People should be knowing, everybody should be, be in agreement in terms of what is the appropriate resolution with respect to this. So because of that, they do this consultation to ensure that complainants are not put through even more trauma. The system doesn't want to traumatize complainants. 
any more than what they've already experienced. Did that answer your question? Kind of. Can I? Sure. So we have a system that traumatizes complainants. No, that's not what I said. No, but I'm saying it. That's a <coughs> statement I'm making. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk to any survivor who has gone through this process, they would also say, we have a system that traumatizes them from the very beginning to the very end. It's just the way that we're structured. And as we discussed in our last um, presentation, there are a lot of things on the table that we can look at to do things differently in order to try to address that. So that all aside, um, that process that you just described, that gray area, is that a public process so that if a complainant um, has worked with the police in order to come to a decision, yes, they've got you know, enough evidence, enough information to take it that next step in order to take it to the Crown Prosecutor? Is, is the result of that consultation between the two entities something that's public and accessible from a survivor, from a complainant? Well, once again, I can't, I'm, I'm not in prosecutions right now, so I really can't answer that. I can only reference back to when I was. Um, we would make it a practice to sit down with the complainant. You, you say, uh, it, public, not in terms of giving a story to the guardian, mm -hmm. but in terms of trying to assist a complainant in understanding these are the decisions that have been made, and here is the basis for those decisions. In, in my own experience, I can think of situations where if we were dealing with people under the age of 18 who were the victims of this kind of conduct, I can think of situations I've had personally where I've met with the parents first, explained the decisions that were being made, explained the reasons for those decisions, and worked with the parents in how are we going to communicate this to your child in a way that's the least traumatic. We'd work with victim services. We would try to... Um, um, explanations would be provided. The manner in which those explanations were provided were attempted to be in, in the most compassionate manner possible. Michelle? Thanks, Chair. So I'm going to just take a step back. So again, just as who decides that this can proceed to, um, to court, um, so it would be the police as the investigative agency that would make that decision. However, they would then take it to the Crown Prosecutor and it's a decision that's basically made jointly. Is that an <coughs> accurate depiction of what I'm hearing? The Crown would give the police officer an opinion on whether there's a reasonable likelihood of conviction. And based on that opinion, the police officer... It, it, it is police who ultimately have the decision whether to lay a charge. That's black and white, okay? But then that consultation takes place, and that can inform the police officer's decision. Michelle? And okay. does the complainant get any input into that decision? So if they say the likelihood of it not being, not, not being um, it, a case that would, I guess, result in... I don't want to say a win, but you know what I'm saying, like being favorable for the complainant. If that decision's made in that consultation pro process, but the complainant wants to continue um, and have it go to court, does the complainant have that ability in order to press forward? In, in those meetings that I've said I've had with complainants in the past, complainants have changed my mind. Okay, right. You go in with an open mind. If you have new information that's not in the police file, or, you know, it, 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 well, any, any, these, I've, I've told you that these cases are all so unique. You know, something new comes out in the course of your discussion. Well, I didn't know that. Um, it, so so the, it's, it's a two-way conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Sherry. Sure. And this is, I'm very intrigued by this whole thing, just sure. obviously. But, but I have to tell you, I'm questions. here as the police commissioner. I, I am not here as a prosecutor. And yes. if, if these are the questions you want to explore, really, it's current prosecutions you should be talking to and not me. Okay, that's probably fair, yeah. So one final question. Um, if 
that whole conversation between the Crown Prosecutor and the police does not result in what the complainant would like to see as the outcome of the process, is that the time in which the complainant would file, a, and it doesn't go forward, let's say the, they have said we're, we're not, like the outcome of that consultation is to not proceed, is that the point in which um, a complainant would file a complaint about the way that the police process has occurred um, and where the outcome would be? Or is it just if it's against an individual police officer? Oh, what, not what, the, process? the process we're talking about is yeah. not police misconduct. We deal okay. with police misconduct. Okay, thank you. I'm good, Chair. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Uh, any, any, anybody else? No. Um, <clears throat> just a very quick question. Um, over the last couple of years, you've, you've seen a lot about. Um, BIPOC issues and, and, and about what? Black Indigenous people of color issues coming forward and coming towards the commissioner. Um, would there be anything in place like are they allowed to when they if if, if people identify as 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 a different color or something they they want to do a complaint to you? Um, do you allow third third parties to go with them to? Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And plus, one of the nice things about the Police Act is it allows the police commissioner to retain such outside services are, as are required. Now, for example, we have never had a complaint from an indigenous yeah. or a, a self-identified indigenous person, yeah. but I've thought to myself, if, if we had such a complaint, how would we craft a, a response that is meaningful to the person who's filed yeah. the complaint? And we have the ability to retain the services of an indigenous person to assist in our processing of the complaint so that person feels like they have an audience of someone who Great. who has had similar life experiences to them. That's important because I, I get important. that I get that a lot and, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll uh, definitely relay it. I think that's important for for us to talk about that too as well, that, that they'll, they'll be heard and uh, yeah. We do have yeah. enough flexibility, as I say, in the act to craft a response that the complainant feels is responsive. Great, perfect. Okay. I want to thank you for coming in today. Um, time here was well served uh, in this committee, and we'll be we'll be writing a report in in for the February session of the legislature with some recommendations. So, yeah, but thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you for you having me. For having us. We will. Does the committee want to just keep going? Right now? Okay. Or we'll we'll wait. Thank you, committee. And uh, so we'll move on to number five. So we're just going to, I think everybody has uh, some correspondence there. We have, we received some correspondence from uh, the, the minister. Um, just wanted to see about, um, do we want to uh, go ahead with booking a meeting with the manager of victim services on Friday, December 17th at 10 a.m.? That's what, that's what the question is. The letter is there. Do not believe the minister's coming in. Is that a, that's, do we should talk about that? Yeah. Chair, we just received this now, or did you send this before in an email? Yeah, yeah. I'll give us, I'll give the committee a second to read the, the letter. Michelle? So based on this letter, I would assume, is that the only, um, only people that he's offering to come to the standing committee because I would suggest that um, the Crown Prosecutor is incredibly important to come to committee and so I don't think that this would be um, an acceptable list of witnesses to come to present to us. So I would ask that um, we ask the Minister to revise that list to ensure that the Crown Prosecutor's office will be represented. Okay, that's a suggestion. How does the committee feel it's just about victim service? I don't know if I gave you enough time to read the letter. Just a second. I don't think we asked. 
ask for the Crown Prosecutor. No, we didn't ask for the Crown Prosecutor the first time through, so I'm a shot. So we asked for the minister in the department, right? And perceivably anybody who would be impacted by this situation. So to exclude the Crown Prosecutor would be an omission. We didn't ask specifically, but I mean, yeah. we asked for anybody that would be representative of yeah. who's it, who this is impacting. Yeah, exactly. And then I guess at this time, we, we know we're now bringing up with the Crown Prosecutor. Is there anybody else that I lost the committee? Uh, so that I think what we're looking at doing is uh, revising maybe following up with correspondence to include the Crown Prosecutor in, and then the next question would be if they can attend that a December 17th meeting, if the committee can can convene on that day too as well would be another question. <clears throat> uh, Rob? I, I somewhat agree with Michelle in respect that when we asked the minister to send you know, himself or a representative to private with somebody to speak on this particular issue, he's come back with the victim services uh, uh, person. But you know, I think after the discussion here, we would certainly see that uh, you know, the, the police commissioner is sort of saying that the Crown Prosecutor plays a role in this whole process. So so I would uh, suggest that, although we weren't specific in who we asked, we weren't specific in this person's request either. That's what the minister decided. I go back to saying, uh, you know, a letter should go back to the minister stating that, you know, uh, we feel that uh, if in light that you are not able to come to represent your department, to uh, represent all the sections of the department, uh, we suggest that a, a Crown Prosecutor or somebody to represent the Crown Prosecutor's office uh, should uh, come in with this particular person and we can kind of get it over at once. So uh, I guess ultimately, I mean, we're still giving some leeway to the Minister to decide who's the most appropriate, but I think we're saying that uh, in light of the current situation that that is only scratching the surface. I think we need to go a little further and the Crown Prosecutor's Office should be uh, represented in that conversation. Sure. Perfect. So that's uh, Zach. Can, you, or can the clerk just quickly go through the schedule of who we have coming in and then that might, that might kind of narrow like, for the rest, for the remaining schedule? Yes. So cool. on Friday we have Charlottetown Police Service coming in in the morning, I believe. Okay. Um, and then next week we're actually going to talk about it in a second, but we could potentially have a meeting next Wednesday, depending on how the committee feels with the Department of Social Development and Housing and the Community Outreach Centre Working Group. Okay. And that's all until the new year. Okay. With the possibility, sorry, Chair, with the possibility of Friday, the December 17th. 17th, yes. Okay. okay. Thank you, Chair. Great. Thank you, Clerk. So, is it okay if we send a letter back to the minister um, confirming the 10 a.m. on the 17th with the addition of the Crown Prosecutor? The representative of the Crown Prosecutor's Office. If available. Would that be okay? If, no, not if available. Oh. It, I, don't, Somebody, I don't necessarily yeah. think that victim services is exactly who we need to talk to on their own. I think that we want to speak to yeah. the Crown Prosecutor's Office. Yeah. And um, I would say that the, if the two can appear at the same time, then that was the, this, how we should schedule it. Sure. Yeah. I shouldn't have added the if available. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> not. It's not an if. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Lynn? Thank you, Chair. I know I'm not a regular member of this committee, but I would, I would suggest that the topic the committee is trying to study is the druggings that is happening, that continues to happen. And I'm sure that a conversation with victim services will be informative on the wonderful work they do. I've met with victim services a number of times. They genuinely are amazing. But it seems to me that the question we're trying to answer is what's being done on this particular topic in some sort of a preventative way, um, some sort of a reaction to what has happened. And I'm not sure victim services is the scope of that question. I would be interested in talking to the, the minister himself to find out if he has any intentions of issuing a directive. Has there been any work happening within the department specifically to dig in on this. I feel like just passing as victim services is really abdicating his responsibility in this conversation. So 
I do agree with my colleague that it makes a lot of sense to bring in the Crown's office, uh, at least a representative as part of that conversation. But I would also request that the Minister accompany Victim Services so we can actually talk about what the Department is doing from a justice perspective, from a public safety perspective, in addition to just... Sure. Um, because Lynn's not a member, uh, Michelle Beaton. I will move that we ask the Minister of Justice and Public Safety appear as well as the Crown Prosecutor. Okay, so that's a motion on the floor. Um, is there any debate on that motion? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those against? <clears throat> uh, motion passes. So um, there, there we go. So we will have, we'll send that letter out. Um, the committee will see that before, before it goes, I think. Yeah, or no, I'll see it and then we'll send it out. <laughs> okay. Um, is that okay with that discussion there? Okay, perfect. So um, the other thing is um, the community has decided to invite the Department of Social Development and Housing to present on shelter beds and the Community Every Center Working Group to present in the same meeting. Shelly Cole is the spokesperson for the working group, um, but she also works for the department. So um, just wanting to, to uh, the department, and she was going to provide a briefing on shelter beds. She's willing to come in next Wednesday, December 15th at 10 a.m. for both presentations. Um, just trying to see what the committee uh, would like to do with that. Uh, Carla? Uh, Chair, I would like us to see another member of the working group come in. We've heard from Shelley Cole. I think that we need to hear from someone who's at arm's length from government mm -hmm. on this topic. And, um, you know, if she is the contact person for the emergency shelter beds. I get that. But I think when it comes to the, the conversation with the outreach center and the working group, I'd like to see another member of the working group come in. Okay. Um, how does the committee feel? I oh. think Sam has something. Sorry, I was just going Quick. to mention that Shelley did say that other members of the working group would be attending alongside her. I don't have any names yet mm -hmm. confirmed, so I don't know if you'd, the committee would be happy with that, or if you'd rather a different person come in entirely without Shelley. It's up to the committee. Okay. I. Oh, just exact belt. I'm um, fine with Shelley Cole coming in and bringing who she thinks would be good for the discussion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would rather us hear from another member group. of the working group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've, Michelle? We've heard government's perspective on this. I think it is valuable. And I think we also need to recognize and we, when we bring people into this standing committee, who attends with them actually does impact presentations. And I think that it's important for us to hear those um, those. Uh, organizations that are working on this on the ground, feet on the ground. And so I, I would agree with Carla that we've heard from government. Now okay. it's time to hear from other members of the working group. Okay. So sh she will be coming in to talk about shelter beds, and then we will be expecting somebody else from the working group to come in on that day to talk about it. And uh, Carla? I would say kind of two pieces to that is if and this might be without saying, but if the if the working group wants to present together, so not just one presenter, but you know if they kind of want a tag team, because, sure. and the other part of that is, you know, we have heard from government, we've heard from Shelley Cole specifically related to the community outreach center. I'm not even sure she needs to be a part of that presentation, um, because she does represent kind of the government's perspective here, and we've heard that. Sure, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Uh, so that will be noted, and we'll we will send uh, a follow up message and with those instructions on it. Great. That's perfect. Um, any new business at this time? No. Just one more. So the seventeenth yeah. is. I'm sorry. For sure, December seventeenth is. I know you're putting the ask out, but is that a confirmed meeting time? Not at this time. Not at this time. Okay. Um, we have to. We'd have to hear back from the minister and the 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 crown. I do believe, correct? We will ask that question via electronic mail, potentially. Yeah. <laughs> Email. <laughs> exactly. Um, I just have one thing to bring up. Uh, it's uh, under new business that I would uh, like to send a letter of invitation to. Uh, Hockey PEI to come in and talk about uh, the recent incidents uh, in Prince Edward Island. 
uh, regarding some of the racial issues and I would uh, just like to put it out there to the committee about it, what that would what that would be like so if uh, how you feel about that uh, Rob? Based on my only comment would be to uh, I mean, hasn't really made a uh, They're doing an investigation currently. I, I would propose after their investigation, uh, just to get a sense of yeah. what they, may, maybe they're making it going to make a decision that's going to be somewhat solutionary in this. Maybe they're not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, I'll just echo what Robbie uh, indicated. Maybe wait until the the, uh, from what we've heard is there's a third party review and maybe once that review is complete, maybe uh, to get them in to find out what the resolution is. Okay. Uh, Michelle? Thanks, Chair. And I think that this is an excellent addition to our agenda, so thank you for bringing it forward, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also suggest that if it's a third party um, organization that's doing the review, that they actually present their findings to us. Okay. So we're not getting a third person. Okay. So would we hold off on uh, uh, anybody else, Carolyn? No. Yeah. Would any? Would you want to? Do we want to hold that off writing that letter till the the? Or do we do we? Would, could we send that letter that we want to see them afterwards? And maybe bring in the third party, Carol. Um, I'm open to to um, other suggestions, but I like the idea of of sending it um, to let them know that that this is on our radar and that. That this is something that this is an expectation of our, of our committee, and um, I think that it it shows that the severity of it, and that and that we are interested in this, and we'll be following up on this. So I like the idea of sending it sooner rather than later. Yeah, the committee will be okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So uh, great meeting. Thanks for your time this morning. We ran a little bit late. So um, could I get a motion to adjourn, uh, Michelle Beaton? Uh, this meeting is adjourned.